Hello and welcome to Catalyst Magazine Live. This video is from a live webinar held in February 2022. Following our guest speaker, Chris Carr from STEM Learning will take you on a whistle-stop tour of how to use the content to support curricular learning with links to some amazing resources and activities. Our guest speaker today is Dr Estella Gonzalez from the Purpar Institute. Estella will be talking to you about her involvement with vector-borne diseases, mosquitoes and the genetic control strategies being developed. Estella, welcome to Catalyst Magazine Live. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks. First, thanks, uh, Joe and Catalyst Magazine to invite me to do this webinar. Um, of course, uh, thanks everyone who's attending uh, the webinar this afternoon. So as Joe already uh, kindly introduced me, I'm a research scientist. I work with uh, mosquitoes. And I can remember when I decided exactly when I wanted to, to work with mosquitoes, because when I was really young, yeah, I like biology. I studied biology and science and environmental science at high school. I about when I was about 13 or 14, I said, oh, I want to do science when I want when I were an adult, but really ne ne never think about working on mosquitoes. That what happened a bit later. When I was in at, at the university, I became amazed uh, about parasites and insects. And maybe then I think it's when I say like, oh, maybe, maybe that can be very interesting. And now when people uh, ask me what I do, and they say, I, I study mosquitoes. People uh, look weirdly at me like, mosquitoes, why mosquitoes? Why people, why do we need to study mosquitoes? And this is why, because as you can see in the slide, mosquitoes are the coldest, deadliest animals uh, in, on earth. Uh, and why mosquitoes are so dangerous? Because yeah, they are really, really annoying uh, when they are passing around our ears, uh, around our he uh, heads, trying to bite us, but they are not so dangerous by themselves. They are very dangerous because uh, they transmit diseases group of illnesses are called the vector-borne diseases. And that's when the talking is going to be about vector-borne diseases, how they are transmitted, and uh, we're focused later on one of these uh, diseases, the malaria. So vector-borne diseases are illnesses that can be caused by parasites, viruses, and bacteria. This is, these pathogens are one of the parts uh, involved in, in this group of diseases. But and there are another two parts, the vectors, they are the carriers, especially uh, arthropods like mosquitoes or other insects like ticks. And these vectors are the uh, responsible of transfer the, the pathogen from uh, to an, to an animal to another animal. And this is the third part of the vector bone diseases, the host. The animals, usually larger organisms, that can harbor smaller organisms, the, uh, the pathogens, and provides nourishment and shelter to these pathogens. And it's very important to uh, understand that it's not only carrying the disease on, from one on an animal to another. It's also that these pathogens, these viruses, these bacteria, and these parasites have stages of the life cycle inside those vectors and those animals, those hosts. And that's are so important. They are not only carriers. They are half part of the, of the life cycle stages, steps of their uh, life cycle inside the organisms. As I already mentioned, they are on mosquitoes can be probably the, I think the most pre, uh, famous uh, vectors of diseases. Uh, malaria is really, really famous. It's, uh, sadly, it's really famous, but uh, they can also, also can transmit dinghy or it's a, it's a virus or another virus is yellow fever. But there are insects like bugs, uh, ticks, uh, lice, or different types of flies that can transmit parasites like filariasis, um, bacteria that can cause Lyme disease. And I would like to highlight here uh, sunflies, these very tiny insects. I like to describe them like very tiny mosquitoes. They're like three, four millimeters only uh, of size. And I want to highlight them because I enter in the world of petromatosis when studying them. Uh, when I was in Spain, uh, I did my PhD and some work as a technician in the lab uh, studying sunflies and how they transmit leishmania. So, as I already mentioned, vector-borne diseases have three main parts, the host, the vector, and pathogen. But it gets even more complex because the environment can affect 
the three, these three parts. Uh, the environment like the climate, the weather, vegetation, the geology of the landscape of the region. And we can have different life cycles of the pathogens in, um, in the same in, in regions very, very close to one to each other. We have uh, urban life cycles in which the humans and domestic animals uh, act as the host, and we have the vectors too. But there are also another cycles usually that take place in, in jungles or forests where wild animals are the host. Animals like monkeys, birds, felines, and these both cycles can interact. And how that ha can happen? Well, I think that most of us are already familiar with the global change uh, and global and globalization. So we know, as we can see in this map, every country, every continent is now connected by planes, shipping, uh, trucks, like by roads. So we are moving all the time. And with COVID, we have seen how in the news, like one variant is now in one country and two days later is in the other side of the world. And this happened too with vectors and with other animals. They can go in, fly, in planes or shipping and roads. They can be moved or be transported. So this is a really, really risk, big risk. Hopefully, uh, luckily, uh, a lot of governments have implemented vector surveillance uh, programs. So they are in ports, airports, and ground crossings, crossings. So they can check in the airplanes or in the in the air, in the at the ports if there there are uh, any mosquitoes, uh, like exotic uh, mosquitoes, as we can see here in this uh, paper in the title of this article that have been published recently how they have, uh, the uh, exotic mosquitoes have been detected in different airports in Europe. Another important factor in globalization and global change that can affect the transmission of pectropon diseases are the, how we uh, use the land and how we can change the land, landscape. Because we can go to another to a region and start urbanizing, urbanizing it and building houses, building build, buildings. And we can go and deforestate or simply also only disturbance uh, of the land, like modifying the land. All these modifications can increase the density of humans in a new place, uh, can make that human go into forest, uh, and also can modify the breeding sites of the vectors. And all these factors at the same time are going to modify the life cycles of the and transmission of the diseases. So Humans can be in contact with new vectors, for example, or other animals and other hosts uh, can be new hosts for a, for a disease. And finally, we have one of the big, big factors, the climate change. We already know uh, all the, uh, the dangers, and all the, the problems that uh, climate change is, uh, we are facing because of climate change. The increase of temperatures, like extreme uh, climate uh, events, and the warming temperatures that now we have, for example, in Europe, where winters are warmer than they were used to, they used to. So, and we ha if we have like new mosquitoes, maybe they can stay longer and overwinter here, or oh, and they can survive. And if these mosquitoes can transmit virus, new viruses or parasites, maybe diseases that were eradicated or were never were in, in Europe, maybe we can have them now. And now we, I'm going to show uh, a couple of examples about this. This is one of the, of the examples, the first one I want to talk about is the tiger mosquito, uh, Aedes abopictus. And this mosquito uh, can, you can, be found, can be found in, Ameri in America or Asia. But from the early 2000, it, it was spotted like in Italy and some points of Spain. You can see here in this uh, in the left uh, map from 2009 that it was it was detected mainly in Italy and a couple of spots in Spain. Nothing else. Almost like ten more than ten years later, you can see in the map all the red spots where this mosquito has been established. It's already established. It survived there. 
the other places that where it has it has been detected, but it's not established, uh, they are the yellow uh, spots. So uh, this is co this caused mainly because we have warmer uh, temperatures now in winter and can survive th through winter. And also because this mosquito is a huge traveler. It loves going to trucks and, and cars and go through the highways and move along the highways. And you can see, for example, that there's a yellow spot in the UK. It was detected, I think, a couple of years ago, but haven't been established here yet. Probably because the winters in, here in the UK are colder and, can, and they cannot survive. And another example that is going to lead us to malaria, that's going to the disease I'm going to, to talk about later, is a sample about Anopheles stephensi. This is a, a mosquito uh, that you can find uh, originally in, 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 in India, and it has been spread in, to another countries through the years. This mosquito uh, can, is, uh, uh, lives in like in the urban settles, is uh, adapted to urban, to urbanization, to uh, cities. And this is one of the problems we're facing now because this mosquito that has moved to another countries in, in Asia also has moved and has expanded to Africa. And we will see that um, Africa already have, already had a big problem because of malaria. There are already uh, mosquitoes endemic uh, from, from the African continent. But those mosquitoes in, from Africa, they usually are in rural settles. They are not in the cities. But, but now in some places of Africa, this urban mosquito has settled. So now we have like the two cycles of malaria, the urban and the, and the selvatic mixed together. So moving on to malaria. Uh, malaria is a parasitic disease. It's the most threatening parasitic disease. It is caused by uh, five different species of plasmodium that can infect uh, hu humans and is transmitted only by Anopheles mosquitoes. There are different uh, uh, species of, of, of Anopheles. And it depends in the region. You, we can find different plasmodium and different Anopheles species. Uh, malaria, uh, when infect a person, uh, cause uh, acute febrile illness with uh, symptoms like fever, headache, fatigue, chills, and the problem is that it is a lethal disease if it's not treated. Uh, I'm going to go through a little bit through the through the life cycle. It's quite complex life cycle, but as a summary, uh, when a person is infected with with this parasite, first it goes to the liver cells and is spread in the liver. Then, uh, and the parasite have some stages of the life cycle there. The next stage of the, of the parasite is going to invade the red cells in the blood. And it's here in the blood when mosquito bite a person, took that blood, and with that blood, the parasites go into the stomach of the mosquito. Then in the stomach of the mosquito, the parasite is going to release and go into the body of the mosquito uh, again, uh, it's going to go through different phases of the, of the life cycle. And finally, it's going to invade the salivary glands of the mosquito. And what happens when a mosquito bites us or bites a person? In, in the mosquito not only take the blood. When they bite someone, they inject some substances with the saliva because this makes it easy to take the blood. And with that saliva, the parasites are going to be injected into a new person. As I already mentioned uh, earlier, Africa is, has, has a big problem of malaria. Actually, uh, most of the countries endemic of malaria are in Africa, as we can see here in the map. In 2020, more than 200 million cases were registered in the world, and a lot of deaths, 2,000 of deaths. And sadly, uh, children under five are the most affected of this disease. And this is why scientists uh, are trying to find more ways and new ways to fight malaria. Now I'm going to go through some of the tools that we have to fight malaria. First of all, we have 
like a battery of diagnosis, treatments, preventive to chemotherapies, and vaccine. The, for diagnosis, maybe you can see here the rapid test. Yes, maybe it sounds familiar because now we are super familiar with the COVID test at home. We can, we can take at home and it works like the same. In this case, instead of with a nose swab, uh, we, uh, for malaria, it's a, blood, a drop of blood is needed. But it's exactly the same. You put the drop of blood and you can see if you're infected or not uh, with malaria. And this is very important because the sooner you are diagnosed, the sooner you can be treated and then you can stop the transmission of the malaria. There are different treatments, uh, chloroquine, artemisin, and artesunate, sulfasodine, pirimethrin are the most uh, important ones. And there are also the preventive chemotherapy campaigns. Uh, this, this is a like, massive treatment of people, and it's, not, it's only recommended in, for vulnerable populations and at high risk areas, not for everyone, not, in, for, not everywhere. And regarding vaccines, it was when I wrote the article for the Catalyst magazine last year, there was, there was not any vaccine uh, available in the market. Silly last year, we got uh, the, our, the first vaccine to fight malaria. Other tools that we have to, to fight malaria are social and infra infrastructure improvements. Uh, improve the health, uh, health systems. Uh, educate people to understand how malaria is uh, uh, transmitted, that, that, that they need to avoid mosquitoes, like put like the screens in the windows, not going outside at certain hours of the, of the, day, of the day. Better housing, if they have better, uh, better houses, maybe mosquitoes cannot go inside. Um, better sanitation. In this map, I wanted to, to put this, to include this map because we can see that decades ago, malaria was also endemic in other countries outside Africa. You can find malaria in Spain, in Europe, Italy, also in the US, Australia. But what happened? We have very good health systems. We have better infrastructures and really good sanitation systems too. And that's why our, like Europe and other countries have, become, have eradicated malaria. And of course, this is a vector upon disease. So if we can stop the transmission or the contact between mosquitoes and humans, we can try, uh, we, this is another, try to help uh, to stop the, the transmission uh, of the disease. We have two main uh, strategies here. The extensive insecticide spraying is just spray as much as possible. And um, uh, the, this the kind of uh, strategy has an uh, environmental problem because you are uh, spraying all over a place and can be, uh, you can not only kill mosquitoes, can kill other insects, other animals. And we have also bed nets, like simple bed nets that you can put on your, uh, on your bed and try to, to block mosquitoes uh, go to the, to the person. And there are also insecticide treated bed nets. So mosquitoes, when they reach those bed nets, they can they they die because of the insecticide that is impregnated in the bed net. And we can see in this graph how malaria ha in incidence, the cases of malaria have uh, decreased along the years, but it has reached at a plateau. This this uh, decrease has stopped, and now it's like quite. Uh, uh, <laughs> It hasn't decreased anymore since the last three, since 2014, more or less. And why is that? Well, there are two main reasons. In first, on one hand, some of the parasites, some of the species of plasmodium has become resistant to the treatment. So we, when we uh, treat people, they cannot, they, they resist, the parasite resists, and we need another treatment or a combination of treatment, treatments to fight the parasite in, in, the, in the people. And on the other hand, the mosquito, the other part of the disease, the carrier, they are becoming resistant to insecticides. So we, the, all the spraying is useless. And um, some of the bed nets that have, that have been so, so useful and helped a lot to decrease the number of, of cases now are not useful anymore too. So we need to develop new strategies. And this is what I'm doing now with my group here at Parright. 
we are studying new strategies to control the mosquito population. In this case, they are genetic tools. This kind of uh, strategies uh, are eco-friendly and mosquito specific because it's, it's target. We, all, we only want to target the mosquito. We wouldn't uh, target other insects or the environment, only the mosquito that transmit the disease. And what, do we, what are we trying to do with this uh, genetic biocontrol? So at our lab, uh, we modified, we genetically modified mosquitoes, we introduced uh, a gene or modify a gene in the mosquito, and it will be uh, introduced in the wild type population and spread that new trait, that new trait in the in the population. And there are two main strategies for this genetic biocontrol: the suppression and the replacement. With the suppression strategy, what we want to do is to reduce the, the population of the mosquito in the uh, in, in the wild, in the forest, or in the jungle. How can we do that? Uh, we can think, for example, if we release a mosquito, uh, male mosquitoes, that when they mate to a female wild type mosquito, uh, the, the progeny of this female cannot, they don't lay any progeny. They become completely sterilized. So we don't have a new generation of mosquitoes. Then the mosquito, the mosquito population will drop. Also, if, for example, this mosquito, this new modif the modified mosquito, when they mate, only the, the progeny are only males. If with the next the, the next generation are only males, they cannot mate anymore. They cannot going to have new mosquitoes. So the population is going to drop and drop. The other strategy is the replacement. In this case, we don't want to reduce the mosquito population. We want to replace it with a new characteristic. Uh, the new characteristic, of course, if we want to stop a disease, is make these uh, mosquitoes unable to transmit the pathogen. How can we do that? Because we, if we want uh, to, to spread a new trait, a new characteristic uh, in the mosquitoes, we want to do it fast. Uh, so we need a strategy, we need a new method to uh, make uh, these mosquitoes to inherit uh, faster this uh, new characteristic. And here we have our, uh, this, our superhero, I would say, for molecular biology in general, that is CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, it's known as the molecular scissors. And um, maybe I think probably most of you have uh, heard about CRISPR-Cas9 because uh, the group, the scientists that uh, developed this, uh, this method uh, won the Nobel Prize last year, if I know, last year or two years, two years ago, I think it was last year. Uh, so with this group of Cas9 that we can use in our mosquitoes, what we can, what we can do is to target and cut a specific region of the DNA of the mosquito, of the genome of the mosquito. I introduce there and modify uh, the genome and, and put there the gene we want to, to be inherited in the, in the wild type later. And you can see in the, in this, in the figure with the Gene drive, that is this, this is a system that we call gene drive. They like to improve, to make higher the inheritance of the new trait. The mosquitoes will inherit uh, the new trait, uh, the new characteristic very, very fast uh, in, com in comparison with a normal inheritance or Mendelian inheritance. But of course, this, all these studies and our study in our, uh, in our group, we have been study this kind of strategies of new and new methods uh, for at least six, seven years is not is at all. And um, in so the, is, we are we are like the first step of these uh, strategies is the laboratory the laboratory studies. We work with a small cages with a small mosquito populations in the lab. If some of the strategies of some of any of these methods uh, work. Um, are we, we think, oh, this can be amazing if we can make this to larger cages, if we can try this with larger mosquito populations, then we can go to the laboratory population cages. This kind of uh, method, this kind of experiments try to mimic like big, bigger and larger mosquito population and see if what we can, we can saw in, like the, in, in the small cages works in larger uh, population. If that works, then there's another phase. We have to go to the confined field trials. It can be physically, physically confined, 
maybe you can see like a huge cage in the field uh, full of mosquitoes. That would be a physically confined field trial and can also be a ecologically confined field trial. This is more uh, difficult, more complex because uh, by ecologically, it means a region that is confined and we can think of maybe an island. Maybe you can try this in an island because it's only surrounded by, by, by the ocean and it's very difficult that the, the new mosquitoes, if something happens, something escapes, it's not going to reach anywhere. So before going to the field, before going to an open release, there are a lot of steps before that need to be uh, uh, tested. And of course, there's a lot of paperwork, policies, and government uh, bureaucracy behind. Uh, so to conclude, I would like to highlight, um, I think that this, the home take, uh, the home take measures I, I would like to, to give with this, with this talk is how important are vector point diseases? There are more, a lot of them uh, in, that can be spread by insects and other animals. Uh, that these diseases are uh, affected by the environment, by the globalization. So they are so, so complex. And there are many factors that affect them. So not only one tool that people think that with the genetic control, biocontrol is going to be like the magic wand, wand that the one that is going to make all the diseases uh, disappear. This is not going to happen. This kind of diseases that are so, so complex, that have so many factors surrounding them, needs to for uh, strategies that uh, involve uh, different points like the improved, improvement of health systems, sanitization, uh, housing infrastructures, uh, better diagnosis, better treatments, uh, of course, vaccines are important, so super, super, super important. And because there are vectors on these vector upon diseases, the vector control is also essential, can, can, can be neg neglected, but we need a uh, like new uh, sustainable and eco ecology uh, measures to, to help with the, to control these vector upon diseases. Thank you very much for your attention. Hope you enjoy. Okay, everyone, we're now open for question and answers. So if you have any questions, please pop them into the chat so that Estella can do her best to answer them for you. Hi, Estella. Um, you've got a couple of questions appearing in the chat. Okay. Okay. I'm going to start with the... Uh, could you explain the CRISPR gene modification in a bit more detail, please? Yes. Uh, so what I was uh, explaining was that CRISPR-Cas9 is an enzyme and it cuts uh, a specific region of the, of the DNA. But that specific region, we give the guide, it's guided, but uh, a short uh, uh, fragment of DNA that we include when we put the, the, the protein and the, and the enzyme in the, in the mosquito embryo. Because what we do is inject the mosquito egg with the enzyme, with this guide, and with the genomic the DNA that we want to modify or what we want to add into the genome of the mosquito. That's how we modify the mosquitoes. I don't know how if that can uh, answer a bit more. Do you want to go to Georgia so, M? Yeah. How okay. can uh, house infrastructure be improved locally without government interference? Yes, uh, I think that probably uh, most of the things that people can do is like improve windows it's so simple but if you can if you think about houses or when you see in the news uh, houses in africa you can see that maybe they don't have even windows uh screens uh maybe uh better uh, buildings uh, of course governments need to help because um, i mean it's not easy to to improve the housing uh or mainly yeah yeah it's like housing structure is just put some something that can block the, mos the mosquito to go into the house. That would improve enormously because you are blocking the mosquito going to the people. Okay, and Georgia has another question. How accessible is CRISPR and would we be able to use it in the near future or would it require mass manufacturing first? CRISPR is very accessible for scientists right now. A lot of research is going on uh, using CRISPR-Cas9, not only in genetic modified mosquitoes, uh, in therapies, uh, a lot of the scientists are uh, using CRISPR-Cas9 
to look into uh, other infectious, infectious diseases or uh, the, uh, the, uh, the neurodegenerative diseases. So it's right now it's one of the best tools we have because we can modify and it's not only as a treatment or as a finite tool. A lot of uh, scientists, a lot of investigators use CRISPR-Cas9 to understand how the gene wor a gene works, for example. You can modify that gene and see what happened uh, with that gene. And can be, uh, can be done in cell culture, for example, not only to, with animals. Uh, so it's, it's really a, a really useful tool right now for the future. I think it's, like I can say, this is the future of the science. And Excellent. And we have a question from Charlie Pierce. Could a decrease in mosquito population negatively affect the food web? That's a really good question. Uh, I have that question a lot from people when I explain what, what I do. Um, it's so difficult. You, we have to think that there are millions, millions and millions of the mosquitoes. And if we try to, to the reduce the mosquito population, when we, when we talk uh, theoretically about it, it's like we're going to crush mosquito population, but that's really difficult. It's really, really difficult to, to achieve. We aim to reduce it a bit, but not to crush the mosquito population. So I, I don't think we can affect so much the food web. Uh, and also there are other, when the, these, these strategies, uh, a lot of them try to, or what we're trying to, to do is like a temporary uh, uh, strategies, methods. So we can reduce the mosquito population for, I don't know, a year or two or even less but not for forever, not to reduce or extinct uh, a mosquito population in an area, because of course, if it could be ecologically effects. Although, as I said, there are so many mosquitoes that we can reduce them, but I don't think we can just knock them out forever. And that brings an end to this talk on vector-borne diseases. Thank you, Estella, for such a wonderful talk. I am sure many of us have an interest in mosquitoes and the developing strategies to control the spread of malaria. Thank you for sharing your research with us. Estella has written an article on today's topic, which is available to read in Catalyst magazine. Please do explore the edition at the link shown on screen. Catalyst remains a free resource which supports many science-led subjects. Thank you to our audience for joining us today. The next Catalyst Magazine live session features Richard Clayton from the Francis Crick Institute as he discusses his biomedical science research. We now hand over to Chris Carr, who will showcase how today's topic can be used to support curricular learning. Thanks, Joe, um, And uh, thanks, Estella, for her fascinating talk. Really enjoyed that. Um, and just to introduce myself to everyone, um, I'm Chris Carr. I'm the Network Education Lead at STEM Learning. And for the, for the next 20 minutes or so, uh, what I'll be doing is just running through um, a few teaching resources. Uh, so this session is, is mostly aimed at um, educators, um, teachers uh, that may be in the audience, but uh, everybody's uh, welcome to stay if, if you find this, uh, this, this interesting. Okay, so um, just share my screen. So hopefully uh, you can see uh, what's on, on my display at the moment. Uh, so um, I'm going to go through uh, various um, online resources. Um, I should say that everything that I'm about to, to demonstrate here is, is available for free um, online. And in terms of the actual links to some of the websites and the uh, the places where these resources are found. Um, I will post a link at the end, uh, which will take you to the, the STEM Learning website, where you can find links to all of these resources in one place. Okay, so, so please don't panic about trying to note down um, website addresses and so on as, as I'm going through this. Uh, so related to today's uh, presentation, then, um, I'm going to go through, um, first of all, uh, data. Uh, so some teaching resources that relate to um, uh, data. Um, and uh, and hopefully uh, uh, ways in which we can engage students and 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 make this sort of subject come to life uh, really by looking at uh, interesting data trends. So the first um, site that I'm going to reference is a site called World Mapper, um, which hopefully if you can see my screen at the moment you'll be able to see a, a map of the world. Uh, so this is from the World Mapper website. So nothing unusual about this particular map. Uh, but what we can do using this site is to type in uh, particular variables. So, for example, uh, malarial deaths um, across the world. 
And what it does, it skews the picture of the, the world. So it will enlarge um, countries and continents depending on how large that particular variable is. And it will shrink other countries and continents uh, if, if that variable is, is quite, um, uh, quite underrepresented in that particular area. So bear in mind, we're going to look at malarial deaths here. So if I cancel that particular image and bring up this one, you can see a very different image of the world. And uh, what it's done is, is to massively expand um, the continents and the countries where malarial deaths is particularly high. So you can see at a glance uh, that Africa um, as a continent is, is massively overrepresented now. Okay, that is predominantly where the majority of malarial deaths um, across the world occur. Uh, you'll also see that we do still have recognizably uh, India. Uh, sort of top right hand corner, that sort of triangular shape is India. Uh, and we've got some parts of Indonesia. Um, so these are the areas where, where malarial deaths are, are quite common. Um, other areas, you know, the, the westernized parts of the world, most of Europe, um, most of the developed parts of Asia and so on, uh, they uh, start to recede to, to very, very thin lines because you know, the incidence of malarial deaths is, is very, very tiny. So it's a good way, um, pictorially, of, of demonstrating that uh, to students. You know, what, what, does this, uh, what does this actually sort of mean? I should say that the Corresponding data sets that underpin these maps are available as well. So if you do want the students to get into some more detailed data analysis um, about, uh, about the data that underpins these sorts of maps, then, then you can ask the students to uh, access that data um, and start analysing. Um, also, some animations, interesting animations that have been built up. So um, regarding the, the COVID pandemic, um, this is actually a series of, uh, of world mapper maps that have been put together as an animation. And what you see in here is actually the spread of um, COVID um, across the world. So starting in Asia, moving across to Europe, and then finally moving into North America, and then down into South America. Uh, you'll see this animation, it's, it's continuing. We're at uh, July 2020 at the moment, uh, as I speak. Um, and you can see some of the, um, the, the countries in the continent starting to recede in size start to expand again as we start to move, move into wave two, the, you know, the second big wave that started to spread across uh, across the world. So we're going through Europe again and then you know, eventually back into, uh, into America. So uh, some really interesting data dynamics that you can see uh, using World Mapper. So I'd recommend that as, as a great place to have a look at things like um, you know, sort of disease trends um, and, and pandemics and, and finding out where certain diseases, diseases are endemic. You can also change the variables there for various other things not related to disease. Um, our world in data, um, I think Estella actually used this um, for, for one of her graphics. Um, it's, it's a great place to, to actually explore data in, in more sort of engaging ways. So, for example, um, we've just sort of pulled up here a, a data set uh, and that there are many, many uh, um, data sets that come from from research um, happen to be uh, on child mortality at the moment so childhood deaths uh, from the five most lethal infectious diseases worldwide um, I can change the country um, according to what I want my focus to be but I happen to have selected Africa here um, because we're, you know, we're, we're talking about malaria at the moment uh, and we can see how things have um, either improved or, or not improved as, as the case may be as we go through time uh, so, for example, in Africa, going back to the year 1990, we can see that we have actually got, I suppose, regarding malaria, we've actually got an increase um, in childhood deaths um, as we approach the year sort of 2000 or thereabouts. But then as we start to progress from 2000 onwards down to 2019, uh, we can see on the interactive graphic here that actually malarial cases have started to decrease. Still very high, uh, but uh, uh, it's uh, it's interesting to note some of the, the sort of changing trends. Um, also, for good measure, we've got other disease types in here, things like measles, HIV, AIDS, lower respiratory infections, and so on. And we can you know, basically sort of go through that those data trend lines and mine those for uh, information and for data. Again, those of you that um, are interested in in really sort of exploring that detail. Uh, that data in more detail with your students, maybe getting them to do some sorts of stats analysis perhaps on that. Um, you can click on the, the, the table icon here and it will bring up the actual um, raw data uh, that underpins a lot of that, uh, along with various other uh, variables and, and factors there. And you can download that, export that to Excel uh, and take that away to analyze. Um, on the subject of data analysis, um, I'll reference um, a really great um, uh, website by the name of HHMI Biointeractive. Um, 
this uh, this provides you with, with many tools that I'll, I'll talk about in a, in a second, but uh, one that I really wanted to reference here was Data Explorer. Um, so if you want something that's a bit more user-friendly than uh, Microsoft Excel, uh, something that the students can either use um, existing data sets from research, so appreciate this is not about disease, but we're talking here about elephant populations under poaching or finches in the Galapagos as two examples that are provided here, um, or importing your own data set, uh, maybe taken from uh, things like world um, uh, our world in data, uh, as an example, you can import that data set into Data Explorer, uh, this site uh, uh, offered by HHMI Biointeractive, and you can start to interrogate that data in, in fairly interesting ways. Um, the tools that, um, that, that are provided here are explained fully by the website. Uh, but it does allow you know, simple stats analysis, um, uh, graphical trends to be explored, uh, but in a more um, engaging way and a more user-friendly way than perhaps um, uh, trying to sort of work through the, the details of Microsoft Excel offers. Uh, so really useful uh, to know about that one. I'm going to stay with um, the Biointeractive website because it does have an awful lot to offer. Uh, so just sort of scanning down here, um, it's, it's, it's basically a one-stop resource for all things um, biology related. Um, it's got extensive uh, animations, uh, images, uh, data, infographics. Um, it's got uh, lessons, teaching resources, um, teacher guides, um, worksheets for students. It's got uh, articles uh, that, uh, that the students can read and can be used as comprehension exercises. It's a really engaging place to be for all things biology related. Um, this particular example here that I'm sort of flagging is, is just one of the many um, uh, interactive animations uh, that are offered by this site. So if you want some really detailed um, CGI, computer generated graphics and, and, and animations of what's actually going on, for example, when malaria infects a human host, um, you'll find them here. Okay, uh, just one second, just while I navigate through um, all the pages. Uh, so um, next thing I was going to reference was, was Virus Explorer. Uh, so this is an example of some of the interactive um, animations that, that are found on this site. Uh, so Virus Explorer um, looks like this. Um, it provides some uh, engaging interactive animations of uh, some common viruses. Um, it can show relative size of viruses, which is, is often sort of ignored in, in, in the teaching of this subject. Um, some, sometimes, you know, the, the students don't sort of really appreciate that even viruses come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. And, you know, the addition of a, a scale bar, for example, um, is really useful because what we can do is, is use that uh, to teach concepts such as magnification. Uh, so we can turn this into a teaching exercise. Uh, can you calculate uh, the relative magnification of Ebola compared to something like rabies virus, for example? Um, of the 10 viruses that are listed here, um, it, uh, it goes through details regarding uh, the hosts of these. So I can click on um, relative hosts, mammals, birds, reptiles, etc., and watch as the different viruses get highlighted or de-highlighted, as the case may be. Um, we can go into transmission. So arthropods, for example, which viruses are transmitted by um, arthropods. So we've got Zika and we've got tobacco mosaic virus. Um, animal to human, zoonotic, uh, human to human, plant to plant, bacterium to bacterium. So a range of different uh, options there. And what we can also do is uh, to explore uh, the structure of these things. So for example, clicking on adenovirus, I've got a three-dimensional structure which I can manipulate and move around. Um, I can explore the cross-section of the virus. I can look in detail at the replication cycle of that particular virus. So some, some really interesting uh, graphics there. And it doesn't, uh, doesn't just end there because what we've also got is uh, a range of um, teaching uh, resources that can be downloaded. So, for example, uh, a, a worksheet that can be provided to students, uh, which allow them to, which can be set as a homework effectively, uh, and get the students to work through uh, that sort of interactive activity. Uh, and you can sort of see it gets uh, gets quite involved when we start sort of talking about things like magnification and, and comparison on sizes and so on. So it's, it's a really good resource, uh, probably for um, maybe sort of age sort of 15 through to 18, I would say, um, as, a, as a good sort of teaching resource there. Okay, um, just moving to other things. 
Uh, mosquito life cycle activity. Let's start talking about practicals um, that we can do with this, this sort of topic. Now, practical activities regarding sort of small organisms, um, you know, such as mosquitoes and so on, often hard to find, um, not commonly used, uh, at least in UK schools. Um, it tends to be maybe sort of delivered as a bit of a dry topic. Um, but it is possible to get practical work in here. Um, and th there are some really inspirational activities on BioInteractive. So this particular activity, um, takes you through, uh, basically as a, as a teacher, how to build a mosquito life cycle breeder, uh, a mosquito breeder. Um, so basically using sort of commonly available um, materials, uh, household materials and so on, you can build uh, one of these for yourself. And what you can then use, you can then use it for uh, an interactive investigation uh, where you, you take some mosquito larvae from a local pond, stream, river, um, and then sort of see how different environmental factors can affect how quickly the mosquito larvae uh, will mature into, into adult mosquitoes. So it relates very well to, to studies on, on global climate change and so on and the effect that that is having on how quickly uh, mosquitoes are able to breed and how they're able to spread across the world. Um, again, this uh, this resource comes with um, a number of uh, of uh, worksheet activities. Uh, so, you know, to, to display some of these, we've got um, a worksheet here for uh, educators. So, uh, this is like a sort of technical guide: how to spot larvae at different stages of development, um, how to actually build uh, your very own mosquito breeder. Um, and then you know some of the activities that you will be doing with with the students. Uh, there is also an associated uh, student um, worksheet that goes with this as well. Uh, so you know, as a teacher, you, you wouldn't need to sort of think too hard about actually being able to use this uh, sort of resource in the lab. You've, you've got all the resources that you need to carry out that sort of investigation with your students uh, ready made for you. Of course, you can adapt them uh, if you wish to your own requirements. Um, other things to, to demonstrate, um, Microbiology Society um, as a website is, is a great one to, to have a look at because, again, it has some more unusual practical investigations, uh, which are a bit more off the beaten path uh, that you can, you can have a look at um, if you really want to get some uh, inspirational um, practical work into your teaching. Uh, so for this one, uh, this is a bacteriophage practical. Um, you can um, order. Uh, via various sort of online sources, uh, T4 bacteriophages that can infect bacteria. Um, you can order your own supply of, uh, of E. coli, um, as you're probably aware. Um, but uh, putting the two things together, you've then got um, a potential method of uh, an interesting practical. Um, it involves serial dilution of um, T4 bacteriophage um, uh, uh, solutions and cultures um, and looking at how effective uh, those different dilutions of the bacteriophage are at eradicating E. coli. Uh, so again, unusual investigations, uh, but the Microbiology Society is, is a good one to, uh, to, to look at. And I'll also reference um, Science and Plants for Schools, another great website uh, with some interesting um, uh, practical protocols. Uh, this one is all about plant disease. Uh, so it is possible for you to, to conduct some studies um, with uh, various plant diseases. This one is uh, is brown rot. Um, it's, a, it's a fungal disease that, that can affect um, uh, various parts of a, of, a, of a plant, particularly fruit. Um, you can take a sample of that fungus and you can deliberately infect other um, non-diseased fruit. Um, and you can observe um, the progression of disease over a period of time. So you can sort of basically sort of demonstrate uh, transmission of disease caused by a pathogen uh, using uh, brown rot as a, as, a, as a fungal pathogen. OK, so again, more unusual, not the sort of regular type of practical that you might do, but something that would add an inspirational angle, perhaps. Um, the last thing I wanted to reference was the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, another uh, interesting website, there's lots of information on there, um, not necessarily totally aimed at, at teachers or, or, or students, um, but there's information there for the general public as well. Uh, but you'll find an awful lot of fact files, um, uh, factual information about different disease types uh, and so on that you can easily access there, but quite useful for planning lessons and also uh, comprehension information for, for students to, to gather if they're researching uh, particular diseases. Uh, one thing that is very um, squarely aimed at students, however, uh, is this particular uh, app. Um, it's, it's on their website. It's called Solve the Outbreak. 
so it puts students in the um, in in the role of a um, of a, of a scientist um, that is investigating um, a potential pandemic. Uh, so uh, it's in the role of an epidemiologist. Uh, so there's there's a number of different missions um, that you can start here that will take you through the roles of different people that work within this field of science, and um, you're basically like a, an interactive adventure. You have to make the right decisions um, along each step of the way uh, to see whether or not you've been successful. Uh, so it's a good way of introducing epidemiology. Okay, um, finally then. All of the uh, links and resources that I've just been talking about, um, if you're interested in any of those, uh, you'll find via the, the STEM Learning webpage where I've posted all of these. Uh, so this is a resource collection, so malaria and vector-borne disease resources, uh, and you will find links to everything that I have just been, been talking about. Um, how to access that? Uh, you simply need to uh, go to um, a web link. And what I will do is just pop this into the uh, chat. So if you just bear with me for a second, um, I'll just drop this into the chat and you should then be able to uh, copy and paste that into your browser and be able to access uh, those resources. Uh, you may find um, if, um, if there's some sort of issue with you um, being able to access those, it may be because you, you haven't yet joined the STEM learning website. Uh, so you'll probably be prompted if you can't access those just to uh, just to sign in and register. I will just say that signing in and registering on the STEM Learning website is completely free. Uh, so there's no charge at any point for any of these these resources. OK, so, so please do join us. And if you are an educator, um, STEM community um, is, is a great um, sort of sister website to ours. It links in with the main STEM Learning websites, links at the bottom there. It's a great place to join discussions on all things educational, where we share um, resources such as these, okay, and, and teaching ideas. Okay, um, hopefully that was, was useful to you. Uh, so I'm going to stop my, my screen share at the moment, okay, uh, and just sort of come out of this. Um, and I think that's, that pretty much concludes our session. Um, I'm going to stay probably online just for, for a couple of minutes or so afterwards, just in case anybody's got any particular questions that they want to raise. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, I will just sort of, uh, uh, sort of pause there and um, wish you all uh, an enjoyable evening. OK, so it's been great to have you all um, on behalf of STEM Learning. Thanks to you all for joining and thanks to all of our presenters, uh, particularly Estella, uh, for presenting such a, uh, an engaging session. OK, thank you.